He's been too good to not believe. Isn't that right, church? I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've seen others be set free. And it starts with, man, the, the willingness to let go. And for us believers, it starts with breaking bread, coming alongside people. You see, the church was formed by people breaking bread. The well was formed by people breaking bread together. And we just believe here at the well that when you come alongside people, when you walk it out with them, when you get your hands dirty and you get in the trenches, lives are changed. I'm gonna pray over us and we're gonna go. Father, I just come to you in this place, God, and I have nothing to offer these people. But God, I know that you have a word for them. I know that they're gonna hear a story today that will encourage them to give you another shot, maybe for the first time. God, I know that there's chains in this place that are meant to be broken today before they leave. Not tomorrow, not tonight, but this morning. So God, would you come? Would you send your Holy Spirit into this auditorium? It's in your name we pray, amen. You guys can be seated. So church, if you'll recall, Dylan last week brought me up here unexpectedly and uh, I wasn't ready for that. It felt a little awkward and I stood by him for almost three minutes, right? <laughs> but he and Selena and Austin are, are at General Assembly in Indiana. And today is gonna be Redemption Sunday. Redemption Sunday. If you've been with us for the last week, we're in week two of our series, Breaking Bread. Everybody say, Breaking Bread. See, we believe that the church was formed, was, was created by people breaking bread together. And man, here at the well, we know that the church is not the building, it's the people, amen? And then it's the people that, that sat down together seven years ago, probably 10, 15 people, and knew that they were being called to plant a church. They knew that they were being called to plant the well. And so they got together, they gathered around tables and they prayed together and they fasted together and they did life together. They came around one another. And there's power in that. Our sermon today is gonna to be called, We're Here For You. Everybody say, we're here for you. Amen. See, at the well, we, we've recognized and we've seen it firsthand what happens when we're here for people, when they need it most. And I'm gonna share just a little bit about what that meant for me and what it still means to me today as your redemption minister. You see, as a young kid, I didn't have it figured out, obviously, just like every other young kid. We're trying to figure it out. And then I went through life and I grew up in a, a church that, that was, to me, dead religion. I wasn't interested. I wasn't excited about going to church. I didn't realize that there was more. I didn't realize that there was depth to that relationship with Jesus. I just thought it was, okay, I believe he existed. I believe he's real. But that's it. There was no life transformation. There was no fruit. And so as life went on, man, I, I began to, to fail a lot. And at the age of seven, man, my parents, bless their hearts, they had no idea what they were doing. Um, but they took the advice of a teacher, and we went to the doctor, and I was placed on an amphetamine for ADHD for uh, ADD. And at the age of seven, I began to learn that if I take this pill, it will put me where I need to be. It will correct my, my human flaws if I take this pill. Well, very early on, I didn't like the way that it made me feel. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. And uh, man, I, I just kind of grew to despise it. 
And as I got older, I, I found opiates at the age of 13. And I loved them because they made me feel different than that other medicine made me feel. And I'll tell you, man, it's crazy to be in this school today um, with a microphone. Dylan has shared that for himself as well. But, you know, this is a school that I got kicked out of a couple times. This is a school that many of the teachers probably didn't like me. And that's okay, man. I understood. I I understood it even back then. I knew why. But I couldn't help myself. I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to quit using opiates in an effect of my character. It wasn't until the age of 15 that I met Dylan, Pastor Dylan. He was a couple grades older than me, and man, he began to tell me about Jesus. And at first, I didn't want to hear it. I thought I was good. I'm like, nope, I'm good, man. I go to church once a month and play baseball the other three weekends out of the month. You see, my whole life was built around sports. And 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 I'll tell you, man, it wasn't enough. I'll tell you, going to hotels weekend after weekend and playing baseball, man, it was fun for a little while. But as I got older, I knew I was still missing something. There was still a gap there that that baseball wasn't going to fill. Dylan began to tell me about Jesus and about the Lord and what he had done for him and I was interested, but I was still using. I was still on opiates every single day. And and I wasn't, I didn't have any plans to quit because I had tried to quit before and it didn't feel good. It made me very sick. But one night I gave in. One night I came over and I was high at the time and the Lord had been working on me for a couple weeks and I could feel it and I was fighting it. I wanted to to stuff it down and, and not feel it anymore. And so I began to use just like every other day, and I would ignore God's calling on my life. And I would ignore the the push from the Holy Spirit that was saying, just surrender, just give it up. I've got so much more for you. And I was in John and Selena's basement one night, and I finally did. I finally gave in. And it was the most freeing moment of my life, the most freeing moment of my life the night that I finally gave in to the Lord. And I know some of you are in here today and maybe you have never done that or maybe you have and you've walked away. I want you to know that, you know, we can, we can invite people to church every week. We can invite them to, to youth. We can invite them to redemption. But it, it's not gonna be until we come alongside them before they surrender that you're going to see a change. Most people aren't going to be willing to to just give in right away. And Pastor Dylan, he did that with me, man. He kept checking in on me. He kept asking how I was doing, even though I hadn't accepted the Lord yet. And if he hadn't have done that, there's no telling. There's no telling where I'd be today. There's no telling what would have happened to Brendan. But man, like my question, one of my questions for us today is, are we in the trenches When we say we want to break bread with people, when we say we want to do life together, what does it truly look like for us? Are we in the trenches? Are we getting our hands dirty? Do we truly care about other people's struggle, other people's oppression? Are we there when they call or do we hit decline? Do we text them back? You see, people had to do that for me, for me to be up here today. It's a bigger picture than what we often think. We see people reaching out, we hear, we hear from them and we know what they're going through and we just ignore it. And we don't, wanna, we don't wanna invest ourselves into their situation. So church, are you in the trenches with those around you that you know are struggling? Our sermon scripture is Isaiah 1:17. It's going to be up on the screen, Isaiah 1, 17. This is what redemption was founded on. There's a, na- a man named Brandon Lean, and he founded redemption through the Well Church on this scripture. It says, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, and defend the cause of orphans. 
fight for the rights of widows. So church, we're gonna unpack that a little bit, but the context behind this scripture is that there was corruption in, in Judah's leadership, the tribe of Judah, and people were, were showing their true, their true colors by how they were treating one another. And you gotta remember, these are people that do know God. These are people that have been following all of the, uh, the rules, per se. But God put this message on them, and he said, you know, I know you guys worship me regularly. I know you're here every Sunday. I know you go on Wednesday night. But you are not loving others the way I've called you to love them. And it might be hard to hear today. And maybe you're on the flip side. Maybe you feel like you're not being loved the way the church should be loving you. There's two sides to this. I've been on both. You know, Dylan talked about last week a very hard situation in my life when people that I thought were my friends came to Dylan and to John and they said, hey, we're not letting our kid come back if Brennan's allowed to be there. You can imagine how that made me feel. You can imagine um, what that gut punch the impact it had on me at such a young age. But I was that, man. I was that kid that was a little rowdy, was a little rambunctious. But I need you to know here, church, I need you to know that God came for the least of these. He came for the least likely. He came for those of us that, man, five years ago, if you would have said they were doing this now, they would have laughed at you. Those are the people he uses time and time again throughout scripture, the least likely, amen? Has anybody seen that in scripture? It's the least likely. And why is that? Man, I like to think that it's because God likes to show off. He likes to say, okay, you don't think they're worthy of my grace? You don't think they're worthy of my mercy? Watch what I'm gonna do with them. And he does it time and time again. And man, Redemption Sunday I don't know if you guys know in here, but your only shot is redemption. Your only chance in this life is through redemption in Christ. I'm not talking about the ministry that meets on Friday, although we would love to have you, but redemption is your only shot. You all need it. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you make or what you drove to get here. You need redemption in your life. And don't let that be a, a shot at your pride. Let that be your freedom in this place. Right. Let that be the, the thing that sets you free this morning when you come up here and respond. Because I just believe it, man. I believe that, man, we've got a group in Marshfield that is serious about the gospel. But I get it, man. It can be hard to love those that make us uncomfortable. It can be hard to love those that have maybe hurt us. And it can be hard to feel loved on the other end. Our sermon focus is that people need to know the church will be there for them when they need it the most. You see, that's what Pastor Dylan, Pastor Selena, John, my parents, that's what they did. When everybody else was ready to, all right, We'll see how Brendan shakes out. I'm going to step away right now. They didn't do that. They should have. They could have. I wouldn't have held it against them. I deserve that. But they didn't treat me that way. And I don't know who it is in your life right now. I don't know what your situation looks like, but are you loving people when they need it the most? Or is it more comfortable to just back up? We're gonna hear a real life story today from two members in our church who, man, they're, they're gonna share about how the church came alongside them and broke bread with them and absolutely loved them when they needed it the most. And that's what we've gotta get really good at at the well. If we want others to have a chance, if we want others to have what we have, if we really mean it when we say that, we gotta prove it, we gotta back it up. How badly do you wanna see that person set free? Bad enough to pray for them? Bad enough to meet with them for coffee? Maybe not. 
Maybe it's easier to just, they'll figure it out. But I'm not wasting any more of my time or money on them. That first part in Isaiah 117 says, do good. Galatians 6, 9 says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So in this context, what we're talking about today, we can't give up on people. Did you know that goes against everything in the Bible to give up on somebody? It goes against everything in the Bible. When we give up on people, man, we're, we're basically saying it's not for you. What I have is not for you. And I'm not saying that you offer them salvation, but man, he has called us to come alongside people and walk it out. Amen? Amen. Seek justice. I'm sorry, help the oppressed. Help the oppressed. Ecclesiastes 4.1 says, Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. There are people in your life, there are people in this room who are in a helpless state. They're being oppressed by the enemy and they have no idea how to fight back. Do you believe that today? Do you, do you, or you just think everybody's good? Do we believe that there's people in this place today that are being oppressed, that need people to come alongside them, to do life with them, to actually break bread and spend the time that matters when it matters the most. Defend the cause of orphans. James 127 says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God and the Father means coming coming and caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt them. And this just goes right back to, man, there's people that I haven't been called to, to reach. There's people that I haven't been called to walk out life with, but you have. And it, it's just, a, it's a very blunt question today. Are you doing it? Are you, are you waiting for somebody else to come along if Pastor Dylan and Selena and John waited for someone else to come along, I might not be here. I, I, I probably wouldn't be here with you guys today. Um, you know, as I got older and got into opiates and felt the call of God on my life, man, I, I began to, ramp, to run from it. I began to, to go harder in the opposite direction. Things would pop up and I just didn't know how to handle it. And I would revert back. You know people right now that are doing the same thing, I promise you. Most of them are probably closer than you would like to admit. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you in this place and you're not sure how to handle life. You're not sure how to handle your hurts, your hangups, and your habits. Can I tell you in this place that you can encounter a living God today that wipes all that away? You're gonna, you can encounter people here today that want to help you wipe it all away. It's real, and it's, it's the truth. And, man, as believers, we've been called to come alongside those people. We mentioned being oppressed. Something very dark had a hold of me. Something very dark had a hold of me, and I'm not saying that I was demonically uh, possessed, nothing like that, but man, when we're oppressed, when we have something heavy over us for, for years, I'm talking seven, eight years, many of you can relate, but it doesn't ever look like there's gonna be a way out. And that's where we come alongside people and show them that there is. And I, I can promise you, man, Friday nights, our group is filled with people who at one point in their life thought there was no way out. It's filled with people who at one point in their life thought they were always going to be the way they are right now. And it doesn't have to be that way. Just like in Isaiah, the church had a decision to either ignore the needs of the helpless 
around them and worship God in the temple, or they could get, their, get on their hands and feet and get dirty and help the hurting. So are we too proud to jump in? Do we think that that doesn't apply to us? Are you there for others? At this time, I'm going to have our speakers come out. While they're coming out, I want you guys to, to give a nice, warm welcome for Rick and Katie Ely. So Rick and Katie Ely, they've been coming to our church for about two years. I think they were here for the launch day back in September of 21. And man, very early on, I took a liking to both of them. They're just super likable people, super easy to get along with. They got beautiful personalities. Um, and something I'll say about that is my radar immediately goes off when I meet people that, that look like they have it all together because I grew up in that family. I grew up in a family that, man, on the outside, it looked so good, but I knew better. As I got older, I knew better. And so as I meet people in the church, you know, Rick and Katie in particular, I wanted to get to know them more. I wanted to know what life really looked like for them. So I've got a couple questions for them. They're gonna share their testimony today. Um, but man, you guys just go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us a brief outline of kind of what life looked like for you as a kid, each of you. Um, my name's Katie Ely. Um, I am originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I'm one of three girls. My parents own their own business, so extremely hardworking. Um, uh, and outside, looking in, we were a, a pretty normal family. Um, we went to church. Um, my mom taught Sunday school. My dad drove the church bus. Um, but behind the scenes, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, he beat my mom. Um, he beat my, me and my two sisters. And, and that was just a chaotic turmoil to grow up in. So I had a difficult time trusting people, a difficult time um, building relationships. I um, didn't want to let anybody in to see what was really going on on the inside. So I came really good at lying and hiding my feelings, masking my emotions. Um, and just really putting on a pretty good show from the outside looking in. My name is Rick Ely. Um, I'm originally from Southern California. Uh, my parents were both hardworking uh, individuals. They worked a lot, so they kind of left us to our own devices as kids, um, which uh, represented a problem. Uh, when I was about five, I got molested by the bully down the street. He would either beat me up or molest me. That was uh, my two choices. Um, that went on for about five years, but with that, it taught me how to lie. It taught me how to hide my feelings, hide anything and everything. Um, I never told anybody about that until I was in my 20s. So I just had a lifetime of internalizing everything. Um, any problems that came my way, I would just internalize them, come up with a solution, and that's the way it was. Um, so it kind of set me up for failure with any kind of relationships because I had no trust issues, or I had major trust issues. Um, I couldn't trust people because uh, I always felt they were looking for something other than the face value. Um, that's about it. So you guys experienced trauma at a really young age, right? <clears throat> so experiencing that trauma, where did it lead you before you guys met each other? What did life look like for Rick and for Katie before you guys met because of your trauma? Um, lots of figuring out who my identity was. Um, so I looked for it in all the ways that the world tells us to look for it. So um, I tried drugs, alcohol, um, I had um, sexual immorality in my life. Um, just, I ended up marrying uh, another man that I knew was not good for me. Um, he was a good guy, but he just wasn't the right guy. So I just followed what Katie wanted most of the time, and that was my compass. 
I didn't grow up in church, so I had no idea of church values or church, you know, what you're supposed to do. I just knew what I learned. Um, I married my high school sweetheart. We had three kids, and we did not get along. Um, we stayed together for the kids for the majority of our marriage. And I tried anything and everything I could to not be a part of my family. Um, my wife and I just did not get along, so it was easier not to be home than it was to be home and fight. So I found other things to do. Um, I would gamble um, a couple nights a week. I would play softball a couple nights a week. I'd travel on the weekends. Uh, anything to not be home. Uh, and then uh, just couldn't find satisfaction in anything. Right. So fast forward just a little bit for us. Um, you guys meet. You, you begin to, to know that you like each other. Um, how did marriage start out um, at first? Was it rocky? Was, was Christ involved at all? Tell us a little bit about that. The ugly truth is Rick and I were both married when we met. Um, and so our relationship started really terribly because we both had to leave our spouses in order to be together. It was a terrible foundation to start on. Um, we brought three children into that, and that was really painful to blend families together. Um, that was a difficult time, a difficult season of life. Christ was nowhere near the center of our home or our family, uh, let alone our marriage. Okay. So you guys meet, you're together, and uh, you're trying to, to make it work, in, in theory. Trying to make it work probably not going well, like you shared. So when did Christ come onto the scene? Um, I'll let you take that one. We tried going to church several times when we lived in Oklahoma and it just didn't, it didn't fit us. The church didn't fit us. Um, we weren't mentally prepared to have the relationship that we needed to have with Christ. Um, so we would go occasionally. Um, and just kind of go through the motions, check the boxes. It wasn't until truly last year that Christ got a hold of my life um, and in doing so changed our lives, um, our family's lives. Um, yeah, talk about, talk about Easton a little bit, your son. Uh, Easton is my son, he's 14, and if you've met Easton, you know Easton. Um, he's hard to forget. Uh, and he, he was the one that really opened up my eyes. Katie had always talked about church, um, but it was just nothing that we ever got involved with. We went to James River Christmas uh, to see the show, and at the end they asked if anybody wants to give their lives to Christ, and Easton raised his hand and went down and got saved. And at that time, I was probably in my darkest area of my life, um, at that point in time, I was going to commit suicide. Um, and so I just, uh, I thought that was the best thing for my family, for everybody. Um, so when Easton got saved, it kind of opened up my eyes a little bit to a different life. And so I got saved and Easton and I got uh, baptized together here at the well. Um, and even through that time frame. I started to make some changes, but I was still lying. I was still hiding things. Um, talked about deceit earlier. I deceived Katie um, multiple times. Um, I had a severe gambling problem. Uh, ran up a lot of debt that Katie didn't even know about. And that was, again, my thought process was, I'll just kill myself and I won't have to deal with anything. Um, it wasn't until Easton showed some strength of his own and to, that we really started looking at a different life. Uh, it wasn't until this church decided to help us. Um, Brendan would come over to our house once a week and counsel Katie and I through some pretty difficult conversations. Um, and when he says, like, getting in the trenches, Brendan was in the trenches in our living room having those incredibly difficult conversations that Rick and I had been avoiding having for many, many years with putting that mask.
mask on when putting that, that pretty picture out there to the world, Brendan really did come alongside us in his entire redemption ministry, Dylan included. And it meant so much for us, and it was an important part of our story and part of why we're here today because of the commitment that they have. Okay, so you guys, <clears throat> Rick and Easton get saved, and it doesn't just turn things around immediately, church. You still got to walk it out. You still got to face the things that the Lord's asking you to confront. If it's sin, you got to confront your sin. If it's the way you're feeling about another person, you got to have those hard conversations. They don't just go away. It's not how the Lord operates. You can't just close your eyes and everything turn into to magic. Um, so just go into a little bit of detail about, you know, you, you've started this relationship with Christ. Katie has came alongside you. She's trying to see if it's, if it's real, probably, waiting to see how Rick's going to do. Um, you ended up going somewhere one weekend. Talk about that just a little bit. So in October of uh, last year, we went, I went to Men's Encounter. Uh, and it completely altered my view of everything. Um, I came back a completely different person. Um, I was able to leave everything at the cross and just get on my hands and knees and, and pray those hard prayers, um, ask for God's forgiveness, um, truly repent for the, my wrongs. Um, and in doing so, made significant changes through our lives um, to move forward to be those people for other people. Um, you know, right. we, we did have so many people, yourself, Pastor Dylan, Jake Schmidley, um, with my kids was unbelievable. Um, so many friends uh, here through the church that have just stepped up and been there for us every step of the way. Um, no matter what the circumstances, uh, it, it's truly been life changing. I would not be here today if it wasn't for this church and the dedication that the church has for everybody. You guys didn't give up on doing good. Simply put, you didn't give up on doing good and you stuck it out. You stayed in the trenches together. What does life look like for you now? Um. Life is so much more exciting, so much more wonderful, so much more full of joy. I am so thankful to God each and every single day uh, for the redemption story that we have and that we get to tell. Our children, our daughters have come to know Christ. Um, we've already spoke about Easton. Um, Rick and I are um, leaders um, for the um, greeter team and the hospitality team here um, at the well. Um, we're also involved in Encounter Ministries. Um, we're leaders at our post um, here in Marshfield. And most recently, um, Rick and I have renewed our wedding vows. Amen. So we just, Christ is at the center of everything that we do now. He's at the middle of our love, our, our marriage, our family, our hearts, our lives. Everything we do is Christ-focused, and we give him all of the glory and all of the praise for what's happened. Not to mention, the, God puts the people in your lives that you need when you never knew you needed them. That's been the biggest factor for us, is we know we have other people that care about us just as much as we care about ourselves and want to be there for us, to support us. And that wouldn't be anything I would have ever thought possible a year and a half ago. Amen. Well, hey, I'm gonna ask you guys to, to just give everybody one piece of advice in this place that, man, when you talk about your story, what's, what's the, the biggest takeaway for them For me, it's going to be, um, you need to be vulnerable with people. Um, it's, it's really easy to just pretend and say, yeah, I'm good, everything's fine. But you really have to be open and you have to be honest and you need to communicate and let others 
help you. That's good. My biggest takeaway would be give God your yes. Just submit to God wholeheartedly. Let him help you and he will put the right people in your lives. He will put you in the right circumstances. The right situations will just come up and don't don't be afraid. If God tells you something, just do it. Just give in. That's good. Church, give it up for the Ely family. So church, I don't know where you're at today, but I'll tell you the why on how it's worked out that way for them. I've never seen, it's, I've only seen this a couple times, man, a transformation take place so quickly in somebody's life. And I'll tell you why it happened, man. They gave the Lord full access. There wasn't any bedroom doors that were left shut. They said, okay, Lord, if you're real, you can come in and fix it all, I dare you. And he did. But it wasn't until they opened up every single door. It wasn't until they said, Lord, you can have me 100%. I don't wanna hold on to this anymore. I can't, I can't physically go on with what I'm going through. And they met with people. They broke bread with people. They let people come around them at their worst. I think that's the hardest part for those of us in the midst of something. We don't want anybody to know we don't want anybody to come around us. It's not the way it's supposed to be drawn up. Let the church come around you. And church, are you there for people? We're gonna go into a time of response. The altars are open. But whichever side you fall on, make sure you're doing it well, okay?